This is module 1.1, genetic markers. All species show variation among individuals, such as the appearance of these snails. Differences in such traits among individuals can result from genetic variation, coupled with any impacts of environmental conditions. Traits may include appearance, physiology, behavior, and taken together, determine the reproduction and survival of individuals, that is, their fitness. Genetic variation is important because it underpins fitness and evolution. For example, the body weight distribution of golden lion tamarinds has a strong genetic component, and differences in body weight, as you can see in this frequency histogram, contribute to variation in survival and reproduction. Body weight is a fitness character in golden lion tamarinds. Such genetic variation in traits is the raw material on which evolution operates. So without genetic variation, they can't be adaptive evolution. Genetic variation is organized through the hierarchy of life. It's passed reliably from parents to offspring. It can be patterned by processes within and among populations and also among species and so on throughout the hierarchy of life. And so genetic variation informs us about biology from parentage through population biology and onto species relationships and beyond. Genetics makes two main contributions to biology. First, functional genetics. These analyses allow us to understand how the phenotypes of individuals affect their fitness and how they evolve. Also, molecular ecology is a series of genetic analyses that help us to uncover otherwise invisible or intractable aspects of evolution and ecology. This is where genetic markers come into things. To deliver these two kinds of contribution to our understanding of ecology, evolution and conservation biology, we need to be able to measure genetic variation. And this can be done with indicators of genetic variation, that is genetic markers. Two or more kinds of genome of organisms act as sources of genetic markers. All organisms have at least one set of genetic material passed to them by their parents. In many organisms, the main set of genetic material is packaged into chromosomes residing within the nucleus of the cell. This is the nuclear genome comprising nuclear DNA. In addition to nuclear genomes, Organisms may have other genomes born in their organelles. In the case of animals, they have nuclear DNA in their chromosomes inside the nucleus, but they also have mitochondria. These mitochondria have their own genome, the mitochondrial genome or mitogenome, and these are made of mitochondrial DNA. Mitogenomes are not the only kind of genome to be found in organelles of species of conservation interest. Plants have their own type. So they have both of the genomes just mentioned for animals, but they also have chloroplasts. And chloroplasts contain their own genome, the chloroplast genome, which is made of chloroplast DNA. Through development of technologies, DNA is now readily sequenced. It's become quite rapid and quite inexpensive. DNA sequencing may benefit from PCR amplification. This is a process by which small quantities of DNA can be copied many times so that there's sufficient for DNA sequencing. 
This can facilitate the use of tiny quantities of DNA from all sorts of biological materials that could be found in the field, such as hair, feathers, bones, and can even be applied to DNA found free in the environment in very, very small quantities. DNA sequence variation can be visualized directly as DNA sequence data. Um, in this example, we see three different sequences of DNA, which differ by um, one of the DNA positions. The same data can also be analyzed as single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs, as you can see in the box here. DNA sequence can also be visualized as less direct proxies, such as bands on gels. In this example, there are three different DNA sequences. Um, they may not be sequenced directly, but they can be inferred and visualized by running them on some sort of a gel, which separates them by some sort of property, often size of the piece of DNA. Microsatellites are a very commonly used class of genetic marker using this kind of approach. Either way, genetic markers must be heritable and variable. Heritable in the sense that they're passed from parents to offspring in a way that's predictable and facilitates robust analysis. Variable in that they must have a level of variation that's useful for a task of interest. Diploid organisms have two copies or alleles of most of their nuclear genome. Each parent passes one allele to each offspring. So here is a visual example of that. This is a male Arabian oryx that has two alleles at a given locus. The female also has two alleles one of them happens to be in common and one of them happens to be different. Each parent is going to give an allele at random to their offspring. So in the case of offspring number one, the male happened to give band number one to that offspring and the mother happened to give it allele three. In the case of a second offspring, the male might happen to give it allele number two, and the mother might also happen to give it allele number two, which she also has available. And so this individual is has two copies of allele two. Just as a simple example of an application of using genetic markers, we might consider sexing individuals of unknown sex. This works because the exception to diploid organisms having two copies of all of their genome is in the sex chromosomes. And this facilitates genetic tests that allow us to reveal the sex of individuals of unknown sex. So here's a male leopard. It has an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, the male specific chromosome. And this is a female leopard. She has two of the X chromosomes. And so we would be able to visualize the difference between these two sexes on a gel. Organelle genomes follow similar rules to those we just looked at for nuclear genomes with a few differences. The copies of organelle DNA in an individual have the same DNA sequence. So this is true of the mitogenome genome and the chloroplast genome. So if we visualize those on a gel, we wouldn't see two bands in an individual. We'd only see one. Organelles are typically passed on by only one sex of the parent. And this is often the female. That's very, very often true in uh, animals and in flowering plants. Through ever falling costs and improvements in technologies, genetic marker data can be produced at massive scale. 
very large amounts of data are possible to obtain as nuclear SNPs or as genome-wide sequences. And this can be applied uh, not only to the nuclear genome, but also to the organelle genomes. When we combine these approaches with different kinds of genetic marker system chosen well, we can provide huge amounts of key knowledge in understanding population biology and conservation biology. Sorts of tasks that can be undertaken include understanding aspects of individual biology, sexing, detecting species, um, wildlife forensics. We can understand individual fitness, parentage, relatedness, levels of inbreeding. We can estimate dispersal gene flow, um, understand drivers and consequences of habitat fragmentation and connectivity, we can investigate hybridization and understand the distribution of population through landscapes. We can help plan our genetic management uh, interventions in natural systems such as genetic rescue. We can inform population viability analyses with genetic and evolutionary information. And we can understand and characterize conservation units and help design reserves, conservation reserves. This has been part of module one, principles of population genetics. And we'd like to acknowledge these contributors to TSI.